Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar of uh, 2022. This is our 16th webinar, and the topic is on how to deal with food waste. Um, as you might know, this is quite a big problem throughout the world and also quite a big contributor to climate change. Um, so with us, we have three incredible speakers. We have Bruce from Enviro Stewart's, Ellie from Orca Digesters, and Lee from Nurture Growth Bio. So I'll pass it over to you all, and you can kind of share a little bit about your own journey and maybe a little bit about what your company does. So Lee, why don't you start? Yes, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to meet with uh, your um, viewers. Uh, my name is Lee, and I'm the co-CEO of Nurture Growth Bio Fertilizer. We are a fertilizer company that produces microbial uh, bio fertilizers made from rescue food waste. So what we do is that we take food waste from restaurants and supermarkets and we feed them to the microbes in our fertilizer and produce a liquid concentrated formula, which we then sell to vineyards and other high value crops. So six years ago, I was presented with this opportunity uh, to help found Nurture Growth. And I thought it was such a brilliant idea of solving some of the key problems in the world. One of them is to help solve the food uh, shortage. And secondly, there's also, uh, you know, an increase of food waste. So food waste is one of the largest contributors of greenhouse gas, and they estimate that food waste uh, is now the third largest contributor of greenhouse gases. And uh, food waste, uh, there's more than one third of food produced actually is wasted and most of it ends up in landfills. So Nurture Growth is taking that food waste, which would have otherwise gone into landfills and producing a microbial bio fertilizer from it. I'll pass it over to you, Ellie. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mario. So my name is Ellie Porter. I am a business development rec rep for Orca Digesters. Um, I like to say that my impact journey started when I was younger, so I always usually like to start there, um, which is that I was always really interested in science. I always loved being in nature, and I really liked the idea that everything works together um, to kind of form everything that we know in that way. Um, so I took my first environmental science class in grade 11, and that was when I first discovered activism. And I thought that was so cool because it was the idea that you didn't have to be the best at something to actually make it. You just had to really believe in you know, what you were fighting for. Um, so then when I kind of went through my, my journey at university, I was thinking of environmental film because I thought environmental and scientific communication was going to be really important. Um, how we get people to understand our message and how we're kind of portraying that. Um, and I'm also an auditory learner, so words really resonate with me in that way. Um, mostly, though, I love people. And so now I get to work in business development. So I get to love people and I get to network every day. Um, so that's pretty exciting. In university, I really noticed that waste was a real problem. Um, there's just so much stuff in the world. And that's kind of where my journey began to grow in waste management. So I knew that that's where I wanted to kind of start and join the movement. Um, I started out where everyone does who wants to change the world. I picked through garbage. Um, I knew that going into a career in waste was going to be really dirty, but when you spend months knee deep in Toronto's organic waste, you learn something about people's habits. Um, so that's kind of where I started. And then after that, um, I got a, this position at Orca Digesters, um, which was really exciting because I kind of learned that we had a real solution to a global problem that goes you know, far beyond any kind of commercial composting. Um, so Orca Digesters is a Canadian company. We were founded in Toronto. We are a global food waste solution. Um, ideally, what we call ourselves is a hyper-local solution to food waste. So we're looking to step away from the traditional truck and bin system, and we're eliminating the harmful impacts that come from hauling and, and landfilling food waste. Um, yeah. Go for it, Bruce. Um, our corporate mission is to build more resilient business and improve lives. The business side, we work with most manufacturers uh, who 
reduce their energy, water, improve the product yield, uh, create any residuals. Um, but on the, the other side, what we do is we take 10% uh, of our, uh, our time and money, and we do development work in East Africa. We teach people to build water purifiers, use local materials, how to do that as a self-supporting business, how to not cut back trees, boil the water, um, you know, all that kind of thing. And so happy to speak on any of those topics. But on the topic of food waste, uh, you know, as Lee was mentioning, one third of all the food is wasted right now. One ninth of people don't have enough food. So we're wasting three times more than it would take to feed everybody right now without growing anymore. And, you know, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after 10 USA. It would be the second largest consumer of drinking water on the planet is growing food that's wasted, right? And so um, one aspect is what um, Lee and Ellie are mentioning is how do you reduce the harm of not going to the landfill? Uh, but 90% or more of the issue is actually the embedded greenhouse gas growing the food. And the only way to get that back is to keep it as food. And so that's kind of our focus area is how do you go back in the process to not manage the solid waste, but how do you prevent it first? And so we did 50 factories in a row for Walmart Foundation grant, and we found $230,000 per year of food that didn't have to be wasted in these factories. If you put a grocery bag with high and power, you get to London, Ontario before you run out of grocery bags every year. And so our emphasis is on, you know, not just how do you reduce the harm. And so if you do that, if you keep in the supply chain, you get the value of that water, you get the economic value, you get the meal, uh, that kind of thing. And so kind of that's going to be my bent uh, on the various questions as we go. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And it's great that all of you have had slightly different journeys, but have all kind of understood and discovered, uh, you know, the big problem of uh, food waste. And now you're all working towards a solution with kind of different approaches, uh, which kind of leads nicely to the next kind of double sort of question, because we had two members that were curious about this. So we had Rahima was wondering, um, she does research related to, I think, fly, um, uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Fly larvae. Fly larvae, correct. Um, that break down food. So she was kind of wondering what are some of the different ways of breaking down food and organic waste. And then to follow up with that, Solangva from, based in India, she was wondering also like how can we deal with all the excessive uh, food? I think Bruce kind of uh, mentioned that in, in his intro. So feel free to touch on both or just one of the topics because I know all of your um, companies and businesses kind of focus in different areas. So I'll let maybe Ellie go first. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a couple different ways to deal with food waste, which you guys are going to touch on, but I kind of quickly wrote down the ones that I could think of right off the bat and things that people would know. Um, so obviously we have like landfilling or municipal solid waste incineration, which are mainly the things that we're trying to avoid in, in the way of recapturing and getting those resources back, as we are just kind of talking about. Um, in terms of composting, there's a couple different ways that that can be done in terms of commercial composting. We have windrow and vessel vermi composting, black fly larvae composting, like um, you were mentioning before as well. Um, the one that I'm going to be mostly focusing on and talking about is digestion. So there are two different types of digestion, aerobic and anaerobic. Um, of course, I'm coming from orca digesters. So we obviously produce the technology of an aerobic digester. Um, what that means, we like to say we turn food to water, which isn't exactly true, but it kind of gets at the message for people that need to know. Um, so an aerobic digester uses oxygen and microorganisms to break down that food waste. If you want to think about it, um, orca really simply mimics the natural digestion process. So you're really looking at using the same principles that our bodies and other living organisms are governed by, um, so that using those microorganisms to break down the food waste and convert it into that nutrient-dense water or effluent that's coming out. Um, so those are kind of the ways that I know of more um, in terms of composting and, and pulling out the resources that we can use. Um, from the food waste to not kind of lose the, the water, the energy, the resources that it takes, not only to grow the food as we were talking, um, but also that is still in our kind of wasted food. Um, the other question was about kind of what should we do with the food waste and is there other, other options? 
Um, something that I'm sure everybody will really want to push is making sure that we are recycling or reusing as much food as possible, right? So what we like to say, because we really want to encourage people to waste less food, um, we're really looking at feeding the planet, feeding the animals, feeding people, and then you feed the orca. So orca should be the next step to feed um, in order to recycle and gain the nutrients from the food that actually can't be donated or can't be reused um, or can't be sent somewhere else. So that's kind of the angle that we're coming at. Uh, Leo, you want to go next? Because I know you have a similar yes. work. Actually, yes, Ellie and I have very similar technologies in the sense that we are also an aerobic digester, um, but on a much larger scale. Um, but even before talking about breaking down the food waste, let's talk about how we can prevent food waste. So to give you an example, during COVID, um, they saw an increased amount of food waste. So people were shopping a lot less, they were purchasing more groceries, and as a result, there was a lot more waste. Um, so some of the things that you can do is plan out your meals. So this way that you don't have excess uh, food waste, because food waste from home uh, owners like ourselves actually contribute to a lot of food waste. However, the food waste that Nurture Growth actually uses is food waste from food and beverage manufacturers, restaurants, and supermarkets. These, this type of food waste cannot be consumed um, or cannot be reused. So for example, we're working with uh, a vegan uh, food processing plant where they're making vegan meals for grocery stores. So all of their excess preparatory um, food waste now gets collected by us, fed into our uh, technology. And along the way, the food waste is being broken down and we're adding beneficial microbes into our fertilizer. And when it is applied to plants, it actually mimics mother nature uh, in the sense that we're helping to naturally produce nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium without using synthetic fertilizers. So this way, when we are fertilizing and feeding the plants, we're doing it in a very sustainable way without having an environmental impact and also less of an impact to humans. So this is some of the ways that nurture growth is taking the food waste that would otherwise would have to go to landfills and upcycling or what we like to call uh, rescuing food waste. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in really quickly just off something you said if you don't mind? Um, yes. I don't remember who did this study, but one thing was really interesting when you're looking at an individual level in terms of reducing your food. Um, they did this study that because plate sizes um, in North America have grown over the last couple of years and also refrigerators have grown over the last couple of years, people visually don't like to see white space on those two mediums. So you fill it intentionally, not because you think you're going to consume that amount of food, but just because it is unpleasing to see white space in a fridge or on a plate, um, which just on a very basic level is a really easy way to kind of keep yourself in check if that's something that you need to look at, which is kind of interesting. Well, that's great, Ellie. Thank you. And you know, that gets back to um, some of these systems. It's always the output of a system in the waste. It's either an intended outcome or an unintended outcome. And if anything's going to change, you have to change the system. So in that case of plate size, you take a look at what's going into a restaurant. Well, you know, we're throwing away french fries or rice or whatever was put on the side. Okay. Well, that actually benefits not the customer and not the restaurant either. Right? And so how do we change the portion size and give you know, the value of that back to the customer. Hey, you know, you can have this size or this size. This size is a dollar cheaper, which is still less than the value of the food that was wasted. You know, so you're kind of changing the system once you recognize what it is. And it's the same thing we do in each of the factories we work with or, you know, people are used to seeing whatever happens and that's the, the way it is. But does it have to be that way, right? And so you look and, you know, hey, we're throwing out these peppers because by the time they get to the grocery store, you know, they're going to be wasted. Okay, but there's still two days in it. Mm. Let's make a salad out of it. You know what I mean? So you're kind of changing the system to uh, to to reduce it. There's always going to be a little bit left over, which is where you need to do these different things. One other one might be, you know, uh, crickets or something like that. And you're looking at kind of the conversion rate, you know, the mass of the food, the mass of the protein that gets back in the system again, that kind of thing. But, you know, we're always harping on that kind of how do we change the system to not 
waste good food in the first place. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, um, just kind of a recap of a few of the ideas we had, we kind of discussed. So Ellie was talking about how we can use enzymes kind of as a natural digestion, uh, like done at Orca. And she also mentioned later about reducing portion size, um, which me coming from Europe, I mean, the North American portions are always like double the size. So I can definitely relate to that. Um, Lee also mentioned kind of rescuing food waste. So kind of ways that they convert on a larger scale uh, food waste to different types of fertilizers and such. And then Bruce was talking about different systems and factories and also how we can use crickets and other means to kind of reduce food waste and deal with it. Um, that kind of leads me to the next question. So we had actually two members. Um, I don't remember the second member, but Dalton from the US was kind of curious because he, he is now in New York City, but is from Maine originally. And he was kind of wondering how, how we can make waste collection systems more effective um, for food waste in smaller towns and urban places because often those systems are more in place in Toronto, New York City, and kind of those bigger cities. So um, whether it's a small town or urban location, how can we kind of adjust to those places? And I'll give this to Bruce. Maybe you've kind of had experience with this. Yeah. Um, in our own experience, uh, so we have a small office in Elmira, just north of Waterloo, Ontario. And sadly, like the municipal system drives literally right by us and we can't get it picked up, right? We have to hire somebody to come and get uh, our waste bins. So that's not, you know, that would be a service that the city could provide and make money, you know, just charge me and take, pick it up. You're driving right by anyway. Why do extra fuel? So that would be a very straightforward way is, you know, pick it all up on the way by and charge the businesses, right? Uh, would be an easy one. Another one would be if we had a scale on our green bins and the scale doesn't just show you kilograms, it shows you dollars of food. So it's pretty easy to figure out what a bag of groceries costs for the weight. If that showed up on your green bin, hey, you're throwing away $45 of food, right? Then it would make you rethink what you're throwing away. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I actually have something to add to that. Um, so, did you know that North Americans throw away on average uh, over a thousand pounds of food waste a year, and it equates to roughly six hundred dollars a year? So, basically, you're throwing six hundred dollars, you know, away. So, you can prevent that by. Um, for example, scheduling your meals, being a lot more productive. Um, so there's many ways to, to save food waste. But I do agree with you that um, if you put a cost on the food waste and people see that cost, I think they will look at it very differently. But I think that this is where the role of the people and the role of the governments need to work together. So we as constituents in a municipality or a small town need to congregate and talk to our local politicians and demand for these things because we basically they are there to represent our voices. And if the town or that small municipality has an interest to uh, introduce a, a compost or some sort of uh, waste management system. I think that it really has to be driven from the grassroots level up to you know the government for it to be effective. And I think that's where uh, um, you know recycling has been uh, successful in Toronto. I remember when I was a kid, uh, you know they were having recycling programs and starting to introduce compost programs. And I can still remember. The people who you know were lobbying for those uh, type of activities. Mm -hmm. Ali, did you have anything to add? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think one thing that we do need to keep in mind as well is the habit change on a very individual level. Um, humans are a weird species, and sometimes if one garbage bin is closer than one organic bin by like a step, it makes a huge difference. Um, 
we've done multiple studies about mapping where you place organic waste bins um, in relative to where you're actually eating and how that actually does change the amount that gets rescued, um, whether or not we're reducing waste from the beginning, but also the amount that we can then save and rescue and, and move into the next kind of system, which is pretty interesting. Um, the other thing that I was thinking, just in terms of, of ORCA, if I can just go back a little bit to this solution. Now, this is not necessarily a solution that's going to fix everything. Um, we're, we're obviously aware of that. But the idea is for ORCA, we look at it as kind of like a bottomless garbage bin. So it does sit right in the kitchen for a restaurant, a stadium, a hotel. Um, and as soon as they have that organic waste, it gets right into the ORCA. Once that waste is digested, it exits automatically down the existing sewer system infrastructure. That nutrients then gets pulled from the existing infrastructure at the wastewater treatment plant, and it's able to be reprocessed in the same system that is already set up. Um, so a system like that, what you're really looking to do is getting the processing capacity or getting the solution as close to the generation of the waste as possible, um, because that really cuts out a lot of the complexities that we're seeing. I know, so I'm in London, Ontario right now, and although we've run multiple tests over so many years about the habits of people composting, if we can implement a composting system, and all of them have come back very positive, it's so expensive and it's so hard to implement when a city is quite spread out um, that it just hasn't happened. And it's not like it's that necessarily hard, but the operational and the cost complexities are just making it not happen for 20, 30, 40 years, I think. Um, so, yeah. I just, I, uh, Mario, I have something to add to um, just a sure. long uh, case study from I'm in Waterloo, Ontario, and they had an agreement with Guelph to take their organic waste mm -hmm. and they weren't, they were losing money because they weren't generating enough, not enough people were uh, putting out the green bins to actually fill that right and so what they did is they changed now they pick up green bins every week and garbage every other week and just that one change has just you know got everybody doing green bins because it's uh otherwise your your organics are going to be with you for two weeks mm -hmm. yeah those were all well, some great ideas i would also add to what uh, lee and bruce were saying earlier um, it was very interesting because in Switzerland, their system to reduce waste is essentially the trash bags. You have to buy certain trash bags. And so you pay like, I don't know, five Canadian equivalent for like a few trash bags. And so the recycling is free, but all the trash um, is cost money. So. I think that's, you know, like a good system of like, how can we change the behaviors as Ellie was saying? Um, and again, some great ideas regarding the logistics of the, the pickup systems to kind of include different uh, cities and towns to, you know, having grassroots um, initiatives to governments and as Ellie was saying, I think behavior, individual behavior is also important of just how can we individually reduce our waste and buy less groceries um, so we produce less um, to begin with. Um, with a third question, this comes from an Emma based in Toronto. And this is not um, strictly food waste, but I think it does um, tie in. So she was kind of mentioning that she's noticed in grocery stores now biodegradable and compostable packaging tends to be quite common or more common nowadays. So she was kind of curious on how does that work in terms of breaking down in waste management system, whether it's a compost system or just waste management system. And to add to that, I'm always just curious um, which kind of options should we as consumers look for that are most quote unquote, eco-friendly. Um, and yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to start, otherwise I'll choose someone. No? I can start. <laughs> sure, okay. go for it. Um, yeah, I think, I think one thing is that we really need to separate. So biodegradable and compostable are two different words and they do mean two different things, which when it comes to processing is a kind of a big deal. Um, so that's kind of one thing that just comes with learning and, and understanding these different products. But the other thing is there are a lot of new developments in this area, which is really exciting and some like encouraging. And we want to make sure we're encouraging some of these. Um, you guys probably know more different brands, but I know there's 
some interesting developments in terms of like, there's something called air carbon. There's some interesting things with mushrooms and fungi packaging, I think that are pretty cool. Um, I think when we run into issues with these packaging, it's typically because the system wasn't necessarily set up to handle these kind of materials. Um, so for example, some of the paper or compostable packaging, they require very high heat and very long retention time, um, which means if you're using a home composting system, they might not break down or they might take a really, really long time to break down. And that's something that's not really gonna work for everyone. So those materials do end up going to landfill or to the other kind of disposal methods. Um, in terms of the other question, which is, mo which is most sustainable, that's a really hard question to answer in so many different ways. But one thing that somebody once said to me and it really stuck with me is, when you're at the grocery store and you're kind of looking for, oh, what should be most sustainable? What should I really be looking for? There's a bunch of different ways that you can look at it. And one example is if you were looking to buy um, some beans, you know, you have the dried beans in the plastic and you have the soaked beans in the cans. Typically, you can look at that and say, oh, I can recycle a can. It's made of aluminum. It's really easy to recycle. It's quite good. But on the other hand, you can also look at it and say the weight of that can and the water used in the process to actually transport that can. It's quite a bit more in that kind of a consumption than it would to pack flat beans in the plastic packaging. So are you going for that kind of route? Are you going for the plastic packaging? What are you going to do with the plastic packaging? And kind of digging into things a bit deeper on that on that level as well. And I would say like the, the purpose of packaging is to extend life, right? And so if, if you can get by without extending life, then no package is better than any package you could buy, right? So an English cucumber with no package would be more sustainable as long as you ate it before it went bad, right? And so that's kind of one of the things is, you know, minimize the amount of packaging you're getting. And then if you are, um, recyclable does have some potential advantages over compostable because you're keeping that molecule in the supply, right? You're not just de destroying up that molecule. The problem then becomes, is it actually recycled or does it just end up in a landfill? And the other challenge is if it's recyclable or if it's compostable and it gets on the line and the people pull it out anyway because they don't know it's compostable, you don't know. right? It goes to landfill. So it, it's a pretty deep issue with a lot of different things, but um, in general, less is better, less is more, right? So um, uh, the, the more packaging you can avoid, the better off you're going to be. And I like to add to that, um, consumers are demanding sustainability. As you see this trend, um, you know, in packaging, uh, manufacturers and companies are starting to promote that they're using um, sustainable packaging. Or if you take a look at some of the cleaning solutions, now they've uh, concentrated the formula. So it's no longer that big packaging size. Um, at Nurture Growth, we're looking at different packaging that is biodegradable, uh, as well. However, we also have to take a look at if we change the packaging, how does that affect um, the microbes that are in our product? So we have to find a, a, a fine balance between the two. And if we're not able to successfully find this biodegradable solution, what are some of the things that we can do to offset um, you know, some of the carbon footprint. So some of the ways that we like to give back is we donate to community centers that um, are from marginalized communities. So this way, uh, some of the recycled bottles, we will refill them. Some people bring them back to us, we refill them, and then we find other uses for it. So it's about finding creative solutions to, like Bruce said, recycle, reduce, reuse, you know, the existing package that we, that, uh, that we have. Awesome. Yeah, thanks to everyone for sharing those um, suggestions. Um, like, uh, I like what Bruce said that, you know, the less packaging, the better for sure. Um, I always find it's really, I remember I was once in a store and the cashier wouldn't let me get bananas without putting it in a plastic bag. I'm like, what? Like, that doesn't even make sense. It wasn't in Canada or anywhere, but I just found that like, why right um they have and no you you always see that like some people like there's pictures or memes of people that peel the banana and then put it like in uh, some packaging it's like why 
Um, so definitely like the idea of, you know, less packaging and then if possible, recyclable. And I, I like what Ali said also, of, you know, just making sure you understand what can go into the compost, what can't, and, you know, just the life cycle of each of the products. And then Lee was also saying, how, how can we reuse the, the products as well? So I think there's, there's a, a saying, right? What is it? Reduce, reuse, recycle. So um, that's, uh, that's always a good phrase I like to say. Um, and so for the- In that order, right? In Sorry. That, yeah. They're all equal, but they're not. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for the last question, very, very briefly, is there like one or two final tips you would share to the viewers to deal with their own food waste? And also, if you want to add, there might there are some viewers that are kind of interested in getting into work related to food waste and waste management. So if you have any tips there, that's also welcome. Um, does anyone want to start uh, or I'll choose someone? Lee, why don't you start? Yeah, okay, uh, some of the tips. If you're really passionate about uh, waste management and upcycling food waste. There are a lot of great organizations like the three of us here, um, you know, that are constantly growing. Um, you know, Nurtural, for example, we're looking for salespeople, we're looking for marketing people. So please keep a, a lookout um, on our LinkedIn, on our webpage um, for our job posting that's coming out in the next week. Um, so here's your chance to really create impact um, and just not saying, hey, I'm passionate about it, is get involved with great organizations like ourselves and to make an impact. Awesome, Ellie? I don't know how I'm supposed to follow that. That was such a good ending. Um, yeah, I would say the biggest thing is really continue learning, be open-minded. This is an industry that changes a lot. Um, so it's definitely something that you wanna to continue to do, lifelong learner, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the other thing I wanna say more practically in terms of composting or dealing with your food waste or understanding the whole kind of system behind it, you have to do what works for you. Um, you can't be forcing yourself to make it work in a system that really isn't working. Um, so make sure you're taking the time to understand what works for you. Why does it work? Um, and what kind of packaging are you looking to buy? Why does that work for you better than somebody else? Why does this composting system or home composting work or not work for you? What can you do? For example, in an apartment building, can you invest in a vermi composting system? Is that something that you're even interested in doing? Um, and like, you, ha you have to do what works for you. And that's really how we're gonna get everybody kind of up to the same level in that way. I guess it's my kids in the back. Um, so, and I would just add kind of Ellie started with her hands and feet dirty of kind of working it. So it starts with kind of awareness. And so if you take what's going on right now and we're just started, um, and you're gonna find 10% of it had to go out, 90% of it was actually good food that went bad before right, or leftovers or whatever it is, that's gonna lead you to the quantity and the value of it. And then you're gonna to have to look at the root cause. So, well, why is this? Well, I'm ordering six heads of lettuce and I only need three or whatever it is, right? So that kind of process is kind of the way to kind of permanently reduce what you're generating that way. And your food is actually probably your biggest footprint on the planet, not your energy that you're heating your house with or anything like that, because of what's embedded in that food before it even got to the store. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. Um, kind of to re re reiterate, uh, so, you know, get, um, have awareness of kind of the different options and also how to reduce your own waste. And also what Ellie was saying, kind of continuously learning of the, the solutions and different um, choices out there. And then finally, uh, to get back to what Lee was saying, you know, if you are in, in interested, deeply interested, either join an organization or business that's working on this or even volunteer, right? So I know, especially in Canada, volunteering is big. So that's always uh, a great opportunity. And with that in mind, um, if you look into the comments of this webinar, you'll see the LinkedIn of all our three 
panelists. So feel free to connect with any of them if you have any further questions or you, I know Lee is always eager to talk to many people and I'm sure all of you are. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out and uh, hopefully all these insights were useful to all of our viewers. And thanks again, Lee, Ellie, and Bruce for sharing all of your insights today on food waste. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was great. Good night. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah. <laughs>